Good, good, good question. Very good question. I'm in a process now of making copies of, of my teaching, and I will have copies, and probably next week I'll have some, uh, some notes for everybody on what I'll be teaching today. Um, and I'll do that for each, each topic and so on. That's a good question. See, will it something to take home? I don't quite ever ready yet. Um, and um, so I guess we're ready to go. The title, Developing Positive Relationships, Living Effectively, and Personal Growth, is hard to say in one breath. This is a long title. It started out just developing positive relationships because that was my focus. But I wanted to go into other topics and areas that could help strengthen uh, relationships, marital, dating, engaged, whatever it may be, even beyond that, family and so on. And so I, I added on living effectively. And then I figured, well, I'm going to get in some, some interesting research to help the individual as well. So I added on personal growth. So thus the reason for such a, such a long title. Um, okay, today I'm going to be talking about, I guess, relationship guidelines based on research. Um, and what I'm going to do is cover one precept after the next, talk about it a little bit, occasionally get your response. If you have any questions, please just let me know. Um, and it's going to be fun. Now, a lot, of, a lot of these principles I'm going to share, some of you will say, I knew that. Take it as a confirmation. Amen. Others will say, I'm doing that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> But let it encourage you to continue to do it. Amen. Some people will, will do things, and they may be doing the right things, but they don't know how helpful what they're doing, or what they're doing, they don't know how helpful it actually it is, is, and they may get out of the habit. So this may encourage people to continue to do what they're doing well, or what they're doing is important. Okay. Relational guidelines for life and relationships. The following re relational guidelines are researched and validated for effectiveness. These are suggestions that can help build, strengthen, and even restore marital relationships. But I'll add on to that, really all relationships uh, in, various, in various situations. Number one, one of the first principles to follow in relationships, especially marital relationships, is make sure your words and actions match. Make sure your words and actions match. In order to be trusted, one must do what they say they will do. Examples, coming home when you say you will. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. my, my wife's not here so I can say anything I want. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I can exaggerate or distort. Oh no! But um, it's funny because a lot of times I have to be out late during the day. Or I have come home late. Uh, I think it was a Thursday. I'm at home till about 10 o'clock at night, uh, which is late for me. Uh, but my wife is okay. She says, "Well, when will you be home?" I tell her, "Okay." She just wants to know. Well, I'm not home. When I say I'm home, she panics. She worries. So. Thank our cell phones, but anyway, uh, so it, it's helpful. Following through with what is planned. Don't promise what you can't be sure of doing. This principle, I think, is much more important at when a relationship is rebounding or trying to heal from some type of wound. But nevertheless, if this is done consistently, Whatever trust there is can be strengthened. So let your words and your actions match as much as possible. Side note, this is great for parents. Let your words match your actions. Very, very important. Because with the consistency also comes trust and assurance. Amen. Again, as I'm going through this, I may not always stop and say any questions. So if you do have some, please raise your hand. Uh, or Holler, whatever you want to do. Okay. Number two. 
Next, strongly suggested principle in relationships. Don't keep secrets from your spouse. Small secrets may build a barrier between couples over time. Such as purchases. I've been guilty of that. <laughs> Making friends. Being open shows your spouse that you're, you value honesty and that the lines of communication are open. Again, it's about building trust. Quick side note, and I think it's worth just stopping a second. Trust. Notice I wrote it in red instead of blue. <laughs> Emphasis here. Question, if you have any thoughts. He said be open shows your spouse what? Being open shows your spouse you want to communicate. The lines of communication are open. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. uh, trust. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, why, is, why is trust important in a relationship? What might be? Any ideas? What might it be? Yeah, why, why, why is trust important in a relationship? That you can <clears throat> communicate. You, you can like communicate. Get security. <clears throat> security. Okay, can you say more? Your security. Security. Sincerity. Uh -huh. It's like a basic foundation, right? That's where you start. Yeah. A basic foundation to start with. Is, prevents is, further problems. Yeah. It prevents further problems. These are all good. It, it uh, prevents further problems with trust. Very good. Excellent ideas. Any other ideas? There's anything I'm looking for in particular. Oh. Many good ideas here. Sure. Um, how can trust, I got one for you. Kind of a trick question, but not intended to be. <laughs> but, getting way ahead of, the, ahead of myself now, but why would trust, developing trust be important when there's been some wounds in a relationship in the past? Why might building trust be important? Healing comes in. There's healing for that. Healing can come through that? Like, yes, thank you. Yes. Like when you all uh, discuss me, when you get mad, that it'll come out, that it'll <coughs> make it come out, and you start like, remembering the past, you know, kind of whatever situation you have. Yeah. Peace. Peace? Say more. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Trust can be healing because it increases a peace of mind. That's interesting. Can you please say more on that? Anything mm -hmm. else? The peace of mind? Wow. It's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's, it's kind of profound. Yeah. It is kind of profound. It's, but what you said is really, you said it well. It, is, it creates a peace in your heart. It creates a peace <coughs> in your mind yeah. when you know you can start trusting. Yes. Could I, could I say this? It helps you feel more secure yes. and hopeful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Number three, progress through five stages of trust. Have a willingness to trust. Become aware of any personal history that may make trusting difficult, like past offenses or wounds. Be willing to let go of resentment and jealousy. That's huge. And I'm the first to admit that it's not easy. But being willing to let go of resentment and jealousy is powerful. If um, a person is not at least willing to let go of resentment or jealousy, um, it, in my personal opinion, it will prevent love from growing, maybe even enduring. It can be kind of like a cancer in a relationship, actually. Another thought is to be patient if you or your partner, now this is in the what the literature used, backslide. In other words, fail. Be patient 
if you or your partner backslide or fail. Trusting means having faith in your partner. It doesn't mean instant perfection, just improvement. There needs to be some grace because no one will ever be perfect. That's right. And uh, you're looking at them right now. <laughs> 42 years, and uh, my wife didn't give me grace. I would have been in deep trouble a long time ago. <laughs> so, Praise uh, God. And um, I've needed a lot of grace over the years. Okay, number four. Create a trusting atmosphere. Create a trusting atmosphere. Being, in other words, being free to share thoughts and concerns without their fear of reprisal or of being rejected. Listening and then confirming your understanding is a good starting point. Later on, uh, I didn't mean, list it here, when we talk about communication, I'll, I'll be touching upon that in the future. And that'll be learning how to, after the person expresses what they want to express, if the person feels strong, strong general principle, if the other person feels that you have heard what they said and understand how they feel, just understanding it and acknowledge, acknowledging your understanding can be powerful, Amen. healing, restorative, encouraging, hopeful. Mm -hmm. It goes on. Powerful. Uh, another point is feeling emotionally safe is a key factor in developing a trusting atmosphere. Number five, what to avoid. What to avoid. Jealousy is a common culprit in destroying relationships. It is often considered the number one enemy of trust. Jealousy. I would go on and, and say that jealousy, it can be a symptom of distrust. Another way of maybe saying that. Jealousy is not always based on fact. It may be, but it may not be. Some people are assuming, they're making assumptions. <clears throat> I often think, or, or remember sayings my parents had when I was growing up, and I still carry on a lot of things they share with me, which I think a lot of wisdom in, in, in them. And one thing my dad used, used to say, that, that people can destroy lives by making the wrong assumptions. Uh, and so... Um, it's important, I think, uh, something important to remember. The jealous are troublesome to others, but a torment to themselves. William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania, he said, the jealous are troublesome to others, but a torment to themselves. Steps for building trust, number six. Steps for building trust. First, allow space to express feelings. Allow the opportunity to express feelings. I want to add to that, that when it comes to communication, you can hear and understand a person's feelings whether you agree what they're feeling what their feelings are about a particular topic or not. You don't have to agree, but just respecting it, that goes a long way in building trust. Another point, decide to forgive yourself or the other person and or the other person. Decide to forgive self and or the other person. And when we talk about emotional healing, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And I try to approach it from a whole different perspective than the way uh, the Western world, probably most of the world for that matter, thinks of, thinks of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not have to be um, condoning. 
In fact, forgiveness is not condoning. Forgiveness is not justifying. Forgiveness, forgiveness is not uh, um, uh, saying something was all right. Forgiveness is refusing to allow the pain to continue in you because of the verbal, physical offenses of someone else. I once came up with a term, it just popped in my head, don't know where it came from, but I'll share it with you. <coughs> Simply put, forgiveness is not condoning or excusing or justifying, but it is choosing to cancel a debt and close the book so you can be free Amen. of the other person's offense. You deserve to be free in spite of their behavior. Amen. And so with that definition, I like to share with people that forgiveness is not a weakness, it's a strength. Amen. Forgiveness is not a failure, it's a victory. It's not surrendering, it's overcoming. That's difficult. If a person can get that deep inside and begin to think through, through uh, from, that, from that perspective, uh, it can be powerful. And we'll touch some more on that in the future. Steps for building trust. Make a commitment for a new beginning. Mutual commitments are the ones that work the best, meaning when both people make the commitment, it's certainly going to be more effective than only one person, of course. One person can have an effect on the relationship, but two can truly, truly um, see wonderful things happen. Another uh, step for building trust, agree on ways to prove uh, trustworthiness, such as allowing time. Uh, it's important a lot of time for this to happen. But agree on ways to prove trust, <coughs> such as maybe ask, how can I help build trust in our relationship? What can I do to build the trust? Question. What might be some ways in a relationship where people can build trust? Nothing I'm particularly looking for. What are ways that people can build trust in relationships? Always make the other person feel um, wanted, safe, secure. Um, Help anyone. the person, thank you. Yeah. Helping the person feel wanted, safe, secure, and that can help build trust. Thank you, thank you. Any other ideas? Communication. Communication, say more please. Um, communicating any insecurities you might feel at the moment um, to build that trust and get reassurance. Wow, okay. So, so um, expressing your, your weaknesses, your, your fears, what you're saying, can help build trust. Yeah, that's actually based on research, actually. That is research, it's a fact. Yes, yes? Being accountable for your behavior. Wow. Being accountable for your behavior can help build trust. All of these are excellent. Okay, can you say a little bit more? Or maybe give an example of being accountable? Thank you. But hear what you're saying. It's like being honest and, and admitting you're wrong, you're wrong, and then stating you want to correct your wrongs. That's right. Sure. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate your participation, everybody's. It makes this class more interesting for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. Num num number seven. We all can learn from each other, actually. Number seven. Okay, this is big. And we never think of it that much. Patience. Amen. I can be an incredibly patient person and an incredibly in person, in, uh, impatient. Imp yeah, impatient. Not, per not, not patient. <coughs> not patient. Um, and um, when it comes to people, I'm very patient. That's why I'm in the field I'm in. 
when it comes to mechanical things, electronic <laughs> things, technical things, oh. I'm so impatient that sometimes my brain when I break something. Uh, I'm a even I'm a patient. I'm not even patient with light bulbs. I'm not patient with anything. And people I am. I guess it's better between the two. Uh, but um, I didn't get it from my dad. He was the opposite. He's incredibly patient with making things, building machines, had very little patience with people. I'm glad I took it from my mom. But anyway, it's interesting. We all have different areas where we're more patient than, than other areas. But trust needs to be developed over time, and it does take patience. Mm -hmm. Patience over time is a fertile soil that every lasting relationship needs. So in relationships, it is important to be patient with your, with your partner. If there's no patient, it is like growing a plant in soil that is too thin with too little water. <coughs> Sometimes patience needs to be developed. This is a tough question, and I don't know whether anybody has an answer to this, but how might patience be developed? If, it, if you are impatient, what might a person do to become more patient? Pray. Pray. Yes. Pray. Okay, thank you. See, look at yourself through... Uh, uh, you're impatient with somebody because they're not responding or not doing something or not changing fast enough for you. Look at yourself in God's eyes. Look at yourself. And say, okay, how does God see me? And that'll encourage you to be a little more patient with somebody else. Yeah, look at yourself. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes? Just not giving up, persevering, keep trying. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, good ideas. Yeah. Um, <coughs> all, all good ideas. Another point now in developing relationships, another area, number eight, is risk taking. Risk taking. De risk taking. One example is developing trust is taking a risk. There are no guarantees. Life is a risk, actually. People don't think of this, but every time you get up to, in the morning to go to work is a risk. I mean, you get run over. You know what's going to happen. Uh, traveling's a risk. Uh, when you have goals, there's no ironclad guarantee. Life is full of risk. Life is a risk. But sometimes, uh, in relationships, risks have to be taken. <clears throat> Trust takes faith. Faith in the other person and your relationship to experience real love and intimacy. Faith and love are powerful. And sometimes to have faith in the other person, to, to love them, uh, is a risk. A necessary risk. Some will say, well, um, I don't believe in taking risks, uh, but did you uh, get in your car to go to work this morning? You took a risk. Um, did you cross the street? You took a risk. So really, relationships do take, take risks. Not trusting your partner may make you feel safer in the short run but it will rob you of the opportunity to experience real love and intimacy in the long run, especially as the years go by. Number nine, past wounds can impact the present. Past wounds can impact the present and frequently do. You may need the help of close loved ones, friends or counselors, in order to work through past wounds. Talking helps, a listening ear helps. It takes courage to admit to a painful past. The only way to engage in a trusting relationship 
is to heal from the painful memories. Addressing, addressing mistrust from the past allows you to experience complete trust in the present. Healing from relational wounds is a process over time, and it takes effort. And we're going to discuss this more in a future lesson on emotional healing. Number 10, having a vault, not a fault, a vault with V. Having a vault. Vaults are safe places where things are kept safe and secure. Couples need to have vaults between themselves. Create a vault in which you and your spouse can put your deepest secrets, fears, hopes, and dreams. Offer yourself as a secure vessel in which your spouse can confide in. Number 11, do not expect perfection. This is huge. Do not expect perfection. Instead of perfection, expect flaws and mistakes along with the good things. Focus on and be thankful for your partner's positive traits. Focus on and be thankful for your partner's positive traits. When we talk about the power, uh, even secular research actually, on the power of the mind and the power of positive thought, it's incredible. It is, I think, incredible what they're discovering. <clears throat> My premise is this. If couples could, on a daily basis, think for a few minutes every day, if they're able to, on the positive characteristics of their spouse, their significant other, if they can focus on the positive attributes relationships would be restored, I think divorce rate would go right down. If I could magically say, if I could magically just say from now on, five minutes every day, every spouse, every loved one is going to think for, for five minutes on the positive attributes and qualities of the person, I think divorce rate would be significantly reduced just by the way. I really believe that. The key is not so easy. And others don't know really the power of that. And they don't because they go by their emotions. They go much. by their emotions. They're too hurt to be able to do something like that. They're too hurt to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so they're hurt so much that they can't really stop and look at the positive attitude. So I think you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. Uh, how might a person... That opens up another good question. How might a person, for at least a small period of time or a short period of time a day, get past emotional wounds and focus on the positive attributes of, of a significant other, a loved one? How might they do that? Any thoughts? Prayer. I don't know, thought in my head. Huh? Prayer. Prayer. Mm -hmm. Surrender. I did, think, I did think of that one. <laughs> Prayer is good. Yeah. Surrender. Surrender. Tell me more, please. Well, you're going to have to surrender and then give it to God and God says, keep at it and at it and not in the relationship telling the other person, well, you did this and you did that. You're going to have to let it go. Letting it go, surrendering it to God. Okay. Well, forgiveness Prayer. comes in. What's that? Forgiveness. I mean, you got to start with forgiveness so you can go on with yeah. your own personal life. Yeah. Forgiveness or forgiveness come in. Being thankful. <clears throat> Being thankful. Hold that thumb right back to you. That's good. That's good. But the forgiveness, even if it's just not condoning, not right. excusing, but refusing to to wear someone else's chains. Right. You break their chains off of you, choosing that. Yeah, that helps. But two, you said prayer. Prayer and, and 
releasing it in prayer. <clears throat> faith is important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Faith is powerful. Spiritual faith is powerful. <clears throat> Sometimes that's um, the most uh, powerful way that I know of to break through wounds and hurts and spend up five minutes a day, whatever it may be, on just thinking of things you're really thankful for. Yes, please. Um, I thought it would. Uh, uh, one of the things. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. Give me a hand. She was going to follow up. Yes, being thankful for what you do have through prayer or. Be thankful for what you do have. Yeah, powerful. Powerful. Be thankful. So, two avenues. One is thinking about the positive attrib attributes of the person, which helps you. But the other is to be thankful for other things you have as well, in addition to that. You can do, have, whatever. And well, both, it. both are powerful signs. And, and excuse me. Following through with it, doing it. Yeah. Actually doing, not just thinking it, but you you got to practice it and do it. Practice it and do it. Uh, be consistent. Practice it and do it. Yeah, true, true. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's like saying, well, if you walk every day, if you eat your vegetables, uh, uh, you get your, you go to sleep at night, uh, you'll be healthier, yeah, but doing it isn't always easy, especially the exercise part. Isn't it easy as, as uh, you know, it's easy to talk about it. But. Exactly. Using the Word of God. Using the Word of God. Instead of when you're angry and, you know, you can't uh, communicate with that person because they have a lot of anger, use the Word of God. Use the verses, the scriptures. Because that's what I do with my husband. When there is a lot of uh, anger, I just go to the Word and I text back a verse from a verse or scripture from the Bible. Using Scripture, using Scripture, reminding yourself of it, that works very effectively. And also reminds me of basically, in a broader scale, you're talking about self-talk, redirecting your thoughts on something that you that you have faith in, that you believe in. It's very very powerful. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your, your feedback. So, do not expect perfection. This attitude sets the stage for a love, ba love based on acceptance rather than false expectation. The essence of being human is that one does not seek perfection, just improvement. Side note, if you seek perfection in your partner, he or she will seek perfection <coughs> in you. So personally, I'm not going to seek perfection in my life. I mean, in my, in my, in my life. Yeah. Or in my wife. That's right. uh, because she has a lot to, <laughs> to overlook in me. So I'm going to... Number 12. Expect Bumps along the road. Expect bumps along the road. Research has shown that couples who expect to encounter marital challenges are more apt to face them successfully. There will be difficulties and challenges in marriages. There will be. Mm -hmm. There will be. But when you know it's coming, and it's not the end, it's a speed bump, not an impenetrable wall, then you can get through it. Studies reveal an almost direct correlation between marital success and the expectations that the couple had when entering the union. If you expect a perfect ride, you're bound to be stalled by challenges. Succeeding in marriage means expecting to weather some storms now and then. And this is, I think, a communication is important. Forgiveness is important. Trying to work together through it is important. Well, I have, emphasize the work together. They have to want to work, right? Very good. They have to want to work. Good point. Thank you. Yeah, they have to want to. Yes, willing. Number 13. Make yourself happy first. Make yourself happy first. 
This is a myth. This is a myth. Your spouse should make you happy or be the total source of your happiness. Yes. Sorry, that's a myth. <laughs> okay. You're awake. I you heard that. You heard that. You heard that. That was unanimous. But it's true. But I say that, and it almost sounds like, like, like uh, that's kind of rhetorical. That's kind of like obvious. But it really isn't. It really isn't. My personal observation over, over many years is that many people enter marriage and they figure um, that the other person will, will take care of all my needs emotionally and every other way and all my, all my needs of feeling worth, value, significance, loved, affirmed, etc., etc., will all be met by this one person. And then when it's not, emotionally they crash. You might hold on to this one. You might put this one in your pocket. Again, you will have notes at, at, uh, probably hopefully next week. But but put this in your up here. Put it in your back of your computer. <laughs> Save it. True happiness is an inside job. True happiness is an inside job. True happiness many times many times can come from your own perspective. Many times that intern, in, internal job, that inside job, that happiness from within comes from your perspective. And we'll talk more about that as time goes on. I know a, 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 a friend and colleague, she's a psychiatrist in Brownsville, a beautiful person. She uh, she once said, it's all about perspective. And she would know. She works in like a detention center in Brownsville uh, with some very, very heavy issues. It's all about perspective. So I value that. Relationships should enhance your happiness, not serve as its sole source. Relationships should be enhance your happiness, not serve as its, as its sole source. Love yourself first, and everything else falls into line. Love yourself first, and everything falls into line. This sounds so simple, mm -hmm. but for, for many, it's so hard. Amen. Um, unexpected question. What might be some of the reasons for that? Why is it so hard? I wasn't planning on asking this, but, but it sounds good, like a good question. It seems like a good question. <coughs> Why might it be difficult for people to, to love themselves? What might be some of the reasons? Because they have love. <coughs> Maybe because they choose not to love themselves. Maybe because they choose not to or love because themselves. Because they have a lot of anger issues. A lot of anger issues, and they choose not to love themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other I thoughts? guess because of today's society, the way it is, you know, um, how they view women so up here, you know, and their bodies to be perfect Barbie, mm. you know, type looking, and and that's a lot. Yeah. You know. They they if I hear what you're saying, it's hard sometimes for for, for people to love themselves if you look at the media, and yeah. they don't match up with the media, and so they figure out falls short. Good mm -hmm. point. Anger issues not resolved, yes. Past experiences, abuse, you know, something that just tore you down, broke you up emotionally, physically. Now you feel, you know, that's a good point. Resented, ugly. Or maybe something you did, you feel filthy, unworthy. Well, I'm going to repeat that because I want, I want this to be picked up. <coughs> Many times people um, can't love themselves because of past mistakes. Uh, uh, so I'll use some of my words, shame, guilt, uh, or they've been hurt, hurt severely, wounded terribly, and that can keep them from love themselves. It's all very true. Mm -hmm. All very true. Thank you. And it is, it is very difficult. And some of this is a combination of all these, the same, the same person. 
Now, a couple of you uh, a little while ago alluded to your spiritual faith. That is powerful and probably foremost in loving yourself. If a person looks at it from this perspective, talk about perspectives now, if there is an almighty God, which I personally believe totally, an almighty God, in fact, okay, this in the mornings a lot of times I read scripture myself every morning. I read one this morning. Even the hairs of her head are numbered. <laughs> now with God, it probably gets easier with me every day. <laughs> but I'm still impressed. I'm still impressed. When I was 20, he had a harder job. It's easier. But I'm still impressed. Think about that. Wow. So when I think about how I might be loved, it makes it a little bit easier to love myself. Another approach, though, back to the self-talk, and uh, I mentioned, like, your, your, remember, happiness is an inside job. Someone said a moment ago, being thankful for things. I think someone else mentioned something to the fact of being, well, I, I mentioned being thankful for the other person and their qualities. If you can think of something about yourself you're thankful for, Maybe start with things first, events, past experiences, things without you. Be thankful for that. And then it'll help you ease into being thankful for something about yourself, perspective again, being thankful for you about, about something about yourself is going to be easier to love yourself. Yes? Sorry, could you remain with us? Help me in the recovery is that we, we have the gratitude journal and we write what we're grateful for for that day. We can wow. have these. Wow. And we, we write, and so you're able to see the many things, because God brings those little things that we don't even see them. But when you write them down, you're able to see <coughs> what to be grateful for. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I want to repeat that, Colin. In, in the, uh, is it a 12 step program, you said? Yes. Yeah. In a 12 step program for recovery of whatever, many times what people do is they have like a gratitude journal. A list of things you're thankful for, and they review it. And it helps, I think you said, looking at it visually. It does me. Uh, and also, some, sometimes even hearing it uh, auditorily, I'll say it, I'll say it as well. But yeah, a gratitude journal. Excellent. Something you're thankful for. I love technology. Since you mentioned it, Right here, under under memo pad, all the things that I'm thankful for. Oh. Within myself, without, even future things, I'm thankful now. I hope. It works. It works. I think it may, if you really get into it, it'll work it, it'll work better than Prozac. <laughs> really. Really. So give it a try. It's cheap, it's free, no side effects. <laughs> now, before I got technologically sophisticated, I did it manually. Don't have it with me. But I had a piece of paper, and I whipped the paper out. Look at that. Whatever works. Loving yourself is very, very important. Any other thoughts before we continue on loving yourself? How might a person do that? Any additional thoughts? Yes. Also, reading scripture uh, in front of the mirror and, and saying God loves me and God thinks I'm beautiful and doing daily affirmations in front of the mirror and, and hmm. looking at yourself, saying those things. Okay, good idea. Hard. Good idea. I'm going to close with this. Good idea. Using scripture. The, uh, the New Testament, in my opinion, I'm personally convinced of it, as a whole, is one of the most encouraging books ever written. And so scriptures can be very encouraging. You mentioned something else, though. Saying positive affirmations in front of a mirror. That's right. Now, no one's going to do this because you're going to feel silly. 
Gonna say, gonna say, gonna say, gonna say, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. You don't understand. Some of us are pretty desperate, okay? We can try anything. If he wants to do that, fine. <laughs> he mentioned but, tall. I'm but tall. You, you, <laughs> you, <laughs> my hair's going back. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on that. Okay. I but, but it is it is it is something psychologically uh, I guess uh, uh, mm -hmm. affected. Uh, looking in the mirror helps you focus. Mm -hmm. It helps you focus on what you're saying. And it's mm -hmm. almost like, okay, after I say this, no one's going to want to come back next week probably. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like you're saying it to someone else when you look in the mirror. But it's something about seeing your, this thing say, okay, how does he know this? I, tr I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> Saying, like, I'll use scripture, or I'll use a positive affirmation. And I'm looking, and I'm saying this and saying that, and it seems to, to help. It helps. But, uh, saying things out loud is along the same line as hearing, hearing your own voice. But uh, whatever, whatever <coughs> technique or approach you use, uh, self-talk is very, very, very powerful. And self-affirmation is very powerful. And, uh, <coughs> and you deserve it. You deserve it. I'm going to stop there. Okay, I'm going to be, uh, continue next week, still covering the, uh, the uh, I guess, guidelines, suggestions, and, and uh, characteristics of strong marital relationships. So I um, hope to see everybody here next week. I want to encourage uh, everybody to uh, 